Could I please uh, ask members of the public who are leaving the gallery to please do so quietly? Thank you, because we're about to restart our business. Thank you very much indeed. So the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 8947 in the name of Audrey Nicol on increasing the participation of women and girls in science, technology, engineering and maths. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Audrey Nicol to open the debate. Around seven minutes please, Ms Nicol. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who supported this motion on increasing the participation of women and girls in STEM and colleagues speaking today. And I'm very grateful to the wonderful women I was privileged to speak to during my research. And I'd also like to extend my thanks to the organisations that submitted very informative briefings ahead of today's debate. So STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, integral to almost every aspect of modern society, from food production to advancements in medicine, economic forecasting, a growing space sector, arts, culture, STEM is a key driver of economic growth in Scotland. My personal interest in STEM is deeply linked to the North East energy sector and the rapidly growing demand for a strong STEM workforce to help facilitate our ambition to become a global energy hub. And in his report, Making the Switch, Professor Paul Delu of the Robert Gordon University reminds us the North East hosts a workforce that possesses the specialist knowledge and expertise to deliver and accelerate the energy transition. However, women make up only around 25% of the oil and gas industry workforce and approximately 18.5% of the offshore wind sector. And this is, of course, seen elsewhere with women underrepresented in STEM on multiple levels. And whilst progress has been made to close the gender gap, the gap still exists. The parity in STEM learning between boys and girls diverges as children move through secondary school, with girls significantly less likely to learn STEM subjects beyond higher stage than boys, the leaky pipe analogy. And in their briefing, Close the Gap highlight fewer girls take STEM subjects such as physics, computer science and engineering science at higher level compared to boys. 73% of female STEM graduates do not pursue a career in this area. Only 9% of STEM professors are women, and women account for 11% of directorships in the STEM sectors. Gender stereotyping, a lack of role models, access to STEM programmes, and challenges around work-life balance and family responsibility all play their part. I spoke to many women working in the STEM sphere who spoke about how children's attitudes about gender and work roles become fixed at an early age and heavily influence their future subject choices. Close the gap, gap set, set this out clearly in their briefing. And the crucial role of inspirational teachers and lecturers, supportive parents and carers encouraging but not forcing STEM learning and careers. And the Teach First report, Missing Elements, Why STEMinism Matters in the Classroom and Beyond, highlights that only half of the UK population are able to name a female scientist. But the good news is that I now understand that you can buy a Barbie professor, so all is well in the world. Beyond education, I heard about unwelcoming work environments where stereotypes about the different roles of men and women were strong. One academic spoke of our increasingly gendered society and how some men are, as she put it, blind to the issues of gender imbalance. Another academic spoke of the subtle barriers women in STEM face, while at the same time being constantly reminded of her role as a STEM influencer. Another, an engineer, told me of the pressure she felt to try harder, to do more, to prove herself. And the lack of access to flexible working and good quality part-time jobs was evidence, and critically, access to affordable, good quality childcare. 
common themes about the challenges facing girls and women, but also much consensus on how to respond, and some great examples of work already underway. Aberdeen City Council, the Robert Gordon University, University of Aberdeen and NESCOL have developed the Aberdeen Computer Collaborative, a computer science curriculum from early learning to senior phase designed to encourage young people to consider a career in teaching computer science. Shell's Girls in Energy Partnership, a one-year course delivered with NESCO and Fife College to showcase the energy industry's career opportunities to senior phase girls. And today, the Centre for Health Data Science at Aberdeen University is holding the annual Women in Data Science Conference that will coincide with the annual Worldwide Data and Science Conference being held at Stanford University and around about 200 other locations worldwide. And I was also pleased to note Equate Scotland working in partnership with Construct Ed Scotland, offering a hands-on construction experience for women in graduate or postgraduate engineering. And I look forward to hearing other examples of progress during members' contributions today. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to the CareerWise programme and, Scot and Women in STEM Pipeline project, and I'm encouraged that more female students are enrolling in maths and science college courses, and female undergraduate engineering student numbers are increasing. So what needs to change? Firstly, tackling gender stereotypes. So while initiatives like taster sessions for girls are welcome, they are insufficient to create sustainable change. Earlier intervention in early year settings is required and prioritising gender competent leadership, particularly in wider uh, education settings. And actively recruiting more women into roles where, there are un where they are underrepresented and supporting women to access reskilling opportunities, particularly relevant to the energy sector. And crucially, expanding access to affordable childcare. And in this regard, the Scottish Government's expansion of early learning and childcare child to all three and four year olds and eligible two year olds is hugely significant in not only improving the health and well being of children and parents, but supporting parents into work, study, or training. So, in closing, uh, Presiding Officer, I very much look forward to hearing members respond, the Minister's response uh, to speakers' contributions today. And again, I thank everyone uh, for their support in bringing this debate forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Nicholl. And we will now move to the open uh, part of the debate, speeches of around four minutes, please. And I call Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Pam Gozo. Ms Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thanks to my friend and colleague Audrey Nicholl for securing this important debate. Although STEM subjects are equally as popular with young girls as with young boys, there is a leaky, there is a leaky pipe, as Audrey Nicholl has mentioned, which leads to underrepresentation down the line. It should go without saying, but this is not caused by a lack of skill. Stigma is pushing women away from STEM. There are key barriers here, both material and social. Outdated gender roles lead girls to believe that STEM subjects aren't for them. The Women in STEM project found that a shocking 48% of pupils that they were working with agreed that STEM-related careers are mostly suited to men. Close the Gap highlighted in their briefing that girls are still significantly underrepresented in STEM subjects at school with most recent data showing girls made up just 17% of computing science, 27% of physics and 11% of engineering science students at higher level. This underrepresentation continues into higher education and there has been only a slight increase in the number of women entering STEM degrees. For example, the number of women entering computing degrees increased from 19.9% in 1920 to 22.7% in 2122, and from 41.6% to 
0.8% in the physical sciences. And I think we can all agree that we have to do a lot better here. Early interventions to tackle this stigma and support women and girls in STEM are vital. And I'm pleased to see this being taken very seriously in my own constituency. From McLaren High's consultation with female pupils to redesign their computer course delivery, to Bannockburn High's partnerships with external stakeholders, removing barriers and building passion for girls in STEM. Schools across Stirling are embracing a collaborative approach, building professional networks to share resources and curriculum. Female pupils from McLaren High have reached over 200 pupils across 11 primary schools with STEM and robotics workshops. And this is helping to grow enthusiasm for STEM and providing very strong female role models. This collaborative approach extends into higher and tertiary education. Forth Valley College is working in partnership with West College Scotland, Young Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and Equate Scotland on an ambitious project. By involving older pupils in projects to market STEM to their peers, the Women in STEM project shows the influence of peer mentors in encouraging participation. This project also partners with employers building sustainable pathways for girls to progress into STEM careers, which is absolutely amazing. Innovative thinking is progress, but these ideas need to be backed by funding. A teacher I spoke to said that they had been prevented from running specific girls clubs as it would split already limited budgets. They also highlighted challenges providing after-school clubs to those who live in very rural areas. When we don't make space for women and girls of all backgrounds in STEM, we lose out on essential talent and vital perspectives. It was very good today to hear the First Minister speaking positively about encouraging women and girls into STEM and STEM subjects, but progress is extremely slow. We must take opportunities such as this debate to champion the excellent work already being done, but we need to push for more. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms. Tweed. I now call Pam Gozo to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Ms. Gozo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open today's de debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, and I thank the member for bringing forward this important motion on increasing the participation of women and girls in STEM. The last time I spoke in a debate of this nature, I gave examples of extremely talented females that I had met at universities and research centres. And it was clear to everyone in the chamber just how vital it is to support women to pursue STEM subjects because they bring diversity of perspectives which can lead to more innovative and effective solutions to real-world problems. As the member Evelyn Tweed highlighted, we already know that girls are significantly underrepresented in STEM subjects at higher level. And we already know that the vast majority of female STEM graduates are not employed in STEM fields. So today, I would like to discuss how we act to remove the barriers for our future female STEM leaders. After speaking with the college sector, it is clear that the earlier we engage with the school pupils, the less preconceived gender gaps there are. Colleges are doing some great work engaging with schools. For example, in West Lothian College, there are woodworking activities with local primary schools. New College Lanarkshire also run toddle into STEM events with their earlier year nurseries. Another fantastic example is the North East Scotland College which runs an energy programme in partnership with Shell to encourage women into STEM careers. Close the Gap believe that one possible solution is to ensure that women have access to training and development opportunities, as well as access to high quality, accessible childcare. I am concerned that the lack of action by the SNP government will have a long-term detrimental impacts. 
On the first point, I would say that I am concerned about the SNP's decision to roll back the previously announced £46 million in funding for the Scotland's colleges and universities. That funding was vital to Scotland's innovation landscape, and I hope that its removal will not have an impact on closing the gender gap in STEM. And as for the matter of childcare, I do think Audit Scotland's report about the fragility of early learning and childcare sector is extremely concerning. Childcare providers are absolutely vital to ensuring parents can return to the workforce, and this is key for females in STEM where there is a lack of flexible working and sometimes a culture of, culture of presenteeism. In conclusion, presiding officer, I am delighted to have contributed in today's motion about increasing the participation of women and girls in science, technology, engineering and maths. The, the debate has made it clear that we must absolutely increase girls' engagement in STEM-related activities from a young age to tackle preconceived stereotypes. Secondly, we must empower young females to pursue their careers in STEM by supporting the removal of barriers that exist, such as childcare and more. And last but not least, we must see investment. Without it, we risk undermining the STEM sector and closing the gender gap within it. Thank you, Ms Gozo. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you also to Audrey Nicholl for bringing this dis debate to the Chamber today. Science, technology, engineering and maths are key to boosting future economic growth, driving innovation and finding solutions to some of the challenges of tomorrow and today, like our path to net zero, sustainability, renewable energy, AI and the digital world. We cannot, should not and must not leave anyone behind on our mission to do that. That women and girls are still underrepresented in STEM is just not acceptable, just not unacceptable, it is holding us back. According to the National Science Foundation, only 28% of STEM workers are women. The motion before us today estimates that figure to be even lower. And even fewer women are represented in leadership positions in, in STEM fields. There are many reasons for this, but crucially, they can all be traced back to stereotypes that form, as we've heard, quickly and are ingrained from the very early stages of socialisation and education. To fix that, we need to start in the early years and relentlessly focus on it throughout the life course. A 2019 survey by Girl Guiding found that more than half of girls aged 7 to 10 said that gender stereotypes changed their behaviour and affected how much they participate in class. And nearly three quarters of girls said that they saw or heard gender stereotypes in school. These views form and reinforce ideas of what it means to be a girl or a woman, what jobs are suitable for men and women, what education interests they should have and what role in society they can play. This has had an impact on the decisions that young women and girls then make about their subject and career choices as they move through school, on to further and higher education and into the workplace. You just have to look at data from the Scottish Qualifications Authority from 2021 to see that. At higher level, women were far more likely to study art and design, French, fashion, food tech and childcare, whereas men were more likely to study computing science, physics, engineering and graphic communications. This, of course, leads on to a trend in higher education of young women being underrepresented in STEM degrees, and that follows them to the workplace. It means that despite young women being more likely to have higher levels of educational attainment, they have poorer labour market outcomes. Instead, we see women concentrated in low-paid jobs and gender-based inequalities persist. Presiding officer, I've highlighted many times in this chamber the importance of seeing people like you in a room. The reality is that because the number of women and girls in STEM subjects are so low, it's hard for the generation of women and girls to imagine themselves there. But I say now to all women and girls listening today, STEM is for you. It is a disservice to you that you have been allowed to think otherwise. And it's a missed opportunity for a sector that is too often losing out on the unique perspectives and talents that you bring. We need to change that and the way that we think about STEM to see it as a field that is open to everyone. So as I've set out before and as, as we've heard from contributions across the Chamber today, there's much we need to do to encourage women and girls to pursue careers in STEM and it's our duty to do so. By working together, we can create a more inclusive and equitable world where everyone has the opportunity to reach their full potential. Crucially, a world where women don't have to break the glass ceiling because they've constructed a world without it. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Duncan Clancy. And I now call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Ms. Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank my friend and colleague Audrey Nicholl for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today and for speaking so eloquently on this matter. I was an early adopter in technology, and having done a degree in music in the early 1980s, it quickly became apparent that technology had pervaded even the world of crotchets and quavers, and I found myself composing music for a repertory company using early versions of synthesizers and samplers, which led me ultimately to a postgraduate diploma in IT. Yet at school, IT held no interest for me. The computer room was filled with boys speaking an incomprehensible language. And at that point, I couldn't discern the purpose and potential in IT. But seeing its application in music changed my perception, and I ended up spending time as a computer programmer, systems analyst, and project manager. Ironically, the skills required in many STEM subjects were similar to those I needed for music. Problem solving, communication, creativity, critical thinking and data analysis. And I would say, members, that anybody who has had to interrogate and analyse a complex piece of music such as that by Bach will understand what I'm talking about. Improving the gender balance of STEM subjects in Scotland has been an ongoing issue for all of my life. Looking back even to 2015, when I was first elected as an MP, Skills Development Scotland, in conjunction with the Institute of Physics and Education Scotland, introduced a project entitled Improving Gender Balance Scotland. Eight years on, and the gender gap across STEM subjects is regrettably still evident. STEM women in 2021 note that across the UK, just 19% of those enrolled in a computer science related subject were female. Worse, globally, research suggests that just 3% of students enrolled on an ICT course are female. So my early years in IT were filled with young, ambitious women such as myself, yet fast forward today and we find this sector is one of the lowest ratios of female to male employees of any STEM sector. And over the course of my IT career, I saw many senior roles being dominated by men. The phenomenon already mentioned, the so-called leaky pipeline still prevails and proves this is a complex systemic issue rather than the kinder analogy of a few drips and leaks. Now, I would be very wary of distilling the issue into a somewhat trite SNP bad consideration as world data and UK data demonstrates, for example, that 35% of entrants to STEM higher education subjects are women. Data from the UK-wide UCAS shows that only 25% of them graduate and only 30% of the small number have sustained careers in their related subjects. As young women start to make choices over future careers, perhaps some, arguably like the younger version of me, relate to the phrase, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And those issues that women limit women's economic participation in society, the same issues we come up against time again, caring, childcare responsibilities, gender stereotypes, unconscious bias and lack of flexibility in roles, can be compounded in STEM-related careers, where, for example, short-term breaks have a disproportionate effect due to the speed of technological advancement. So the role of mentoring and network support for women, such as that provided by Equate and mentioned uh, in today's motion, is therefore crucial. And in commending their work and the support provided by the Scottish Government, it's vital that more companies engage with these initiatives to bring about positive change led by and supported by women themselves. And as government wellbeing plans progress, we must focus on a truly gendered lens for all policies. Schools, universities, colleges, business, industry and academia must too all play their part. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. And I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Claire Adamson. Ms. Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank Audrey Nicholl for securing this debate today. We are in a climate emergency, one which requires urgent, wide reaching, and radical change to what is still, despite all our warnings, despite all the evidence, 
a fundamentally fossil economy. If that change is to happen at the necessary scale and pace, it needs the work, the skills, the creativity and dedication of all members of our society. We simply cannot afford to maintain barriers, visible or invisible, conscious or unconscious, of ableism, racism, or, as we are focusing on this afternoon, gendered exclusion. I'm proud that the work of dismantling those barriers, of supporting and enabling women and girls to play a full and active role in climate science and application is well underway in the Northeast. Audrey Nicholl rightly celebrates work happening in Aberdeen, and I'd like to commend the Dundee and Angus Regional STEM Partnership, which includes Dundee and Angus, Angus College, Abertay University, the University of Dundee, Education Scotland, Dundee City and Angus Councils, and partners in industry. In September last year, this partnership hosted a STEM Expo at the Michelin Scotland Innovation Park in Dundee with the theme of sustainable energy. They invited 750 stage two pupils from all 16 public secondary schools across Dundee and Angus, together with other schools in the region. And also, and this is important, secured funding to pay their travel to the event. Over two days, they hosted 438 students and 35 teachers with an equal 50-50 representation of school students identifying as female and male. Building and sustaining these relationships between schools, universities and other institutions is vital to the task of encouraging and supporting girls and young women in, to study STEM subjects and embark upon STEM careers. At the University of Dundee, Professor Sue Dawson has recently hosted 60 secondary school students from Tayside to showcase the key discipline of environmental science in practice. They not only benefited from Prof Dawson's expertise and enthusiasm, but also from her, her example as a woman in a senior role. For, as Michelle Thompson has said, it, we know it is hard, if not impossible, to be what we cannot see. Role models, women in science who display not only professional success, but also integrity, generosity, wisdom and humanity are essential. And we are fortunate in the Northeast to have many such exemplars. Women like Dr. Rebecca Wade of Abertay University, National STEM Ambassador of the Year for 2021 and 2022. The climate crisis is, of course, closely entwined with the biodiversity and food crises, and the Northeast region also has visible and inspirational female leadership in tackling these urgent challenges, with women as two of the three professors at Aberdeen University's Rowett Institute. Aberdeen has also hosted specific conferences for women and girls, allowing potential and active women scientists to share their experience and expertise. These examples of leadership are complemented by initiatives established by women students, including the Women in STEM group at the University of Dundee, which focuses, focuses on sharing information and opportunities, offering support and building an empowering environment. And of course, the range of disciplines in STEM extends far beyond traditional science and engineering. Women are slowly becoming increasingly important and visible within the IT and computing sectors. The growing prevalence of interdisciplinary projects also reminds us that there is no necessary bright line between STEM and non-STEM subjects, and that there are many alternative routes into science and scientific work beyond the traditional pathways. In closing, presiding officer, we all, politicians, academics and business people, need to look beyond formal processes and received wisdom to identify and address less visible factors that lead to underrepresentation of women and girls. The patriarchy we know can be insidious as well as egregious. If we are to be truly effective in both fulfilling individual potential and facilitating responses to critical global and local issues, we cannot simply slot women and girls into existing structures. Instead, we need to find ways to recreate networks, processes and institutions so that they work better for everyone of all genders. That is work for all of us, here and beyond this place. Vital work that cannot be postponed. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Ms Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin also by congratulating Audrey Nicholl on securing today's debate on increasing participation of women and girls in science, technology, engineering and maths. It will be no surprise to the Chamber that this is a topic close to my heart. 
However, the irony is not lost on me that I stand here as one of the leaky pipe highlighted in the motion and referenced in, by many contributors and also referenced in the 2012 Royal Society of Edinburgh report, Tapping All Our Talents. The report was initiated by then scientific advisor within Scottish Government, Professor Damon Glover, and a 2018 review by um, Professor Leslie Yellowlees. In the preface, she asks these questions. Has the infamous leaky pipe and the lack of women making it to leadership positions in academia been fixed? Are more than 27% of female graduates entering a STEM-related job on graduation? Are women in STEM in a better position or a worse position or in the same position as it was previously? And these are questions we have to be vigilant about. As Michelle Thompson indicated, IT is an area where women's participation has fallen behind over the years. So what more needs to be done to enable women to play their full part in shaping our future, helping solve today's career challenges, as mentioned by um, Pam Duncan Glancy, and using STEM-based skills to build a better, more economically vibrant and ecologically sound Scotland. Presiding officer, two of the Scotland's leading outstanding women were involved in that report. Given the importance of STEM with the fourth industrial revolution being upon us, it would be more than disappointing if progress is not being made. I declare an interest today in that I served on the board of CERC for over 10 years, laterally as vice chair until May this year. CERC has been addressing these gendered issues over several years, and I do want to briefly highlight some of their initiatives, including renaming their buildings as the Ava Lovelace and James Jocelyn Bell Burnell Birdlings. We need even simple measures like this to restress the historical and contemporary prevalence of women's contribution to STEM being overlooked. The Scottish Schools Education Research Centre offers a broad portfolio of services, principally in support of STEM areas in the curriculum. From early years practitioners, primary and secondary teachers, to school and college technicians and childminders, their STEM ambassadors programme offers volunteering opportunities for those working or studying at college and university to engage with young people in STEM activities. We received a briefing from CITB for this debate and I thank them for it. One of the STEM ambassadors is Anne Okafor. She highlights currently that only 12.5% of construction workforce are women. And this is a missed opportunity. It's 6% of our GDP and that costs our economy. So Anne encourages more women through her visibility by being a visible and accessible role model that girls can relate to. This is something I have strived through through the volunteering um, roles that I have undertaken and Anne engages with her brownie troop on STEM activities. The CERC Young Leaders Programme, young people have the chance to inspire, lead and mentor their peers through the creation of a delivery of STEM activities and events within their school communities or youth groups. And both the STEM ambassador and young STEM leaders programmes are compatible with the government's ambition in this area. The STEM strategy states the long-term goal of promoting efforts to tackle gender imbalances and other inequalities that exist across STEM education and training should continue apace. Limiting access due to factors such as gender, race, disability, deprivation and geographical location are inherently unfair and continue to undermine our ability to deliver to deliver inclusive economic growth in Scotland and the full benefits of STEM education and training will not be realised until this goal is achieved. Presiding officer, my message for today, women become a STEM ambassador, girls become a young STEM leader. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms Adamson. I now call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Mr Kerr. Well, I would congratulate Audrey Nicholl for bringing this motion in. Of course, she's quite right. And I want to frighten Michelle Thompson by telling her I agreed with every word in her speech as well. Because if we don't maximise the talent and productivity of every single Scot, it's Scotland, it's Scottish business, it's our economy, and it's our society that will suffer. And it's because I passionately believe in equality of opportunity for everyone that I'm a Scottish Conservative. Because to me, that's what Scottish Conservatism is all about. It's about opportunity and choice and supporting every citizen. 
in realising their full potential and to live the best life they aspire to live. This debate, then, presiding officer, is not about the principle of increasing the participation of women and girls in STEM as much as it is how to do it. So what can we do as parliamentarians to encourage more women and girls across our nation to feel confident that they can unlock their full potential in STEM? Well, first, we need to introduce STEM to children from early years through play. I think we should let children discover the fascination of STEM, all the different aspects of STEM. Let them develop their problem-solving skills. Let them build things. Let them get dressed up and encourage them to let their imagination and their curiosity run riot. Girls and boys alike, no demarcations, no barriers from the very beginning of their educational experience. Let's bring STEM to the table in nurseries and in primary and in secondary schools. Let's give our children a vision of all the different kinds of jobs there are in every walk of life, which are STEM-based jobs. And we do have to make a special effort to remove the barriers that seem to have been placed in the way of girls realizing their dreams through STEM. We should have what I would describe as inspirational dissatisfaction about the current level of guidance we give our young people. If we had our way, the Scottish Conservatives would seriously invest in giving our young people the best possible guidance and mentoring. We live in a digital world. Put digital technology in their hands. Teach them to boss the technology rather than becoming bossed by it. Let's bring the different stages of a child's educational journey together. I uh, learned a new word this week, uh, courtesy of Sir Peter Matheson, the principal of Edinburgh University. Interdigitization. I hadn't come across that word before. Apparently, it means, it's a word that describes what happens when we bring our fingers together. Uh, and, and he used it in the context of bringing all the different parts of an educational journey uh, together. They, they need to be brought together. We, so we need to bring employers. We need to bring colleges, universities that are involved with our children much earlier into their educational journey. Guidance, for example, shouldn't be left to S3 or S4 or S5. It's too late at that stage to begin to help our young people, especially our young women, discover where their passions and interests and aptitudes lie, and especially in relation to STEM. Careers in STEM, in artificial intelligence, in the space sector, where we Scots excel. We can't afford our young people, especially girls and women, to think that career opportunities for those sectors are there but for other people. And we can't afford our young people even to begin to think that their dreams can't be followed because they don't have the same opportunity as anyone else. We must change the narrative about what is possible for all our young people, men and women alike. And we must tackle the idea that going to university is the only route to success. If we get the interdigitization right, then our young people should have more exposure to different businesses, different sectors, to colleges and to universities. And they'll begin to see the array, the vast array of opportunity that lies ahead of them. And that there is a choice of pathways, all of which have equal esteem, whether it be an apprenticeship, or professional and technical training qualifications, or studying for a qualification at college or university. But the narrative must change because there is a commonly held disparity of esteem. And that won't change unless the Scottish Government and all of us supporting the Scottish Government tackles this head on. But I have to say uh, that the, to the Minister that the track record of this Government on apprenticeships, on funding colleges and universities leaves much to be desired. Ministers must start listening. They must start to shape policy around the outcomes that we want to see happen, and that may, means making tough choices and setting priorities. We cannot have a deprioritisation of education because Scotland needs its young people to flourish like never before. The world needs our young people to flourish like never before because we are facing big strategic challenges, and it's increasingly to the STEM subject areas and to STEM-based sectors that we look to for solutions. Mr Kerr, but could you please conclude? Thank you. I am. But this government needs to match its actions with rhetoric. So I hope the minister, in his response, will bring new thinking to the role that he's now filling, because we need it. 
And if he does, and he makes the right choices for Scotland and our young people, we on these benches will back him. We need the full potential of our young people, women and girls, men and boys, to be unleashed, especially in the areas of science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Thank you, Mr Kerr. Uh, in fact, we have reached a point where I am required, uh, given time uh, issues, to uh, accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Um, I would ask Audrey Nicholl to move the motion. Moved. Many thanks. Uh, the question is that the debate be, be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are all agreed. And on that note, I call Jackie Dunbar. Mr. Thank you, President Officer. And can I begin by thanking my friend and colleague Audrey Nicholl for uh, securing this uh, members' debate today. Um, I was going to say that I don't believe that I agree with most of what Stephen Kerr was saying, and it will come clear in my speech. Your positive parts, uh, Mr. Kerr, I totally agree with in, in your debate. As the motion states, women in STEM are making important contributions to eco economic growth and to tackling the climate emergency. And that statement applies wherever you are in the world. But in Aberdeen, I think it's something we need to take particular heed of. Our city has the ambition of becoming the net zero capital of the world. Our journey to being able to call ourselves that will not just involve innovation and new approaches, but also a just transition away from the oil and gas industry that has underpinned our local economy for decades. Women in STEM will have a hugely important role in shaping Aberdeen's future, so we need to support and encourage girls and young women into the STEM sector. And when I was discussing this last week, um, I asked how do we encourage girls and women into the sector, the reply I received was quick. And it was simple, and it wasn't something that I had considered. It was, stop stereotyping them. Don't presume they want to play with dolls. Let them play with their Lego, their Kinects, their Meccano, or whatever it is that their young minds are interested in. And it gave me pause for thought, presiding officer. As I remembered, at just age two, my quine got really upset when she went to a Christmas party at her nursery and Sunty gave her a doll. She was really excited to be allowed to open a present early from Sunty, but she thrust that doll at me when I asked her what she got and said in a really upset tone, I got a dolly, I wanted a tractor. I don't know where that attitude has came from, presiding officer. Um, she couldn't understand why she had gotten a dolly while the boys got all the cool gifts. And as you may guess, that was the last time my quine got a doll from Sunty. Instead, she received a presence that expanded her mind and her creativeness. And I'm proud to say that that quine is now a senior OT cybersecurity engineer. And I'd like to think that some of her success is down to us parents encouraging her to play with what she wanted to play with, no matter if it was classed as gender specific or not. Age appropriate at all times, of course, presiding officer. As I said, we need to encourage women and girls into the STEM sector, and I think there is a wide recognition of that need. Given the many initiatives taking place across Aberdeen, a number of which have already been highlighted by Audrey Nicholl, Maggie Chapman and uh, Pam Gossel earlier on, and I'll take this opportunity to highlight two more initiatives in Aberdeen that I believe are, worth, are worthy of praise. Firstly, as we talk about giving opportunities to young women, I want to welcome the work of the Aberdeen University Women in Science and Engineering Society. This is a group of women who have taken these matters into their own hands and who are creating a strong, supportive community of students in STEM and are helping to encourage the next and future generations of women into STEM. Secondly, TechFest. TechFest is a charity based in Aberdeen that aims to promote science, technology, engineering and mathematics activities to young folk and the wider community. They do this work not just across Aberdeen, but right across Scotland. Only this year's International Day of, of Women and Girls in Science, they held an event in Kings Wells, which is in my Aberdeen const Donside constituency, with around 130 pupils from primary school in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire being able to get hands on learning experiences and hearing about careers in STEM. 
And as we consider the so-called leaky pipeline, I'm encouraged by initiatives like these and the efforts being made across the STEM sector. There is work still to do, but we're on the right track. Let us show our girls that it is okay to do you the jobs that they want to do and not the jobs that they think society wants them to do. The more we encourage this, the more we will see the benefit to the STEM sector. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Barr. And I now call on Minister Graham Day to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, President Officer, thank you. Um, we've heard this afternoon some excellent examples of how we can and must work together to create greater and wider opportunities for women and girls to access STEM and employment, training and education. I'm greatly encouraged by what I believe to be a broad consensus right across this chamber on the issue. I've never heard Stephen Kerr so thoughtful and constructive in this chamber. So thank you to Audrey Nicholl for securing this opportunity to explore the topic and see Mr Kerr in a new light. This government, like many other... Uh, Stephen Kerr. Because there is one aspect of this debate that slightly does perturb me, and that is the fact that I think you and I, are the, the Minister and I, are the only male speakers. And I honestly believe that this is actually part of the problem, that women understand what the, the need is, but perhaps not enough men do. Otherwise, we'd have had more male speakers encouraging women uh, and indeed encouraging the breakdown of the barriers that exist for women uh, in this very vital sector. Minister. Uh, for all, sitting here a few moments ago, I was thinking that very point as, uh, as well, and, and it is quite telling. Um, this government, like many others, have been working hard to try and overcome some of the challenges that we know exist, but there is some way still to go. At a strategic level, we should all be proud that Scotland is a world-class research sector where research discoveries drive the improvements and innovations that help us to reach the economic, societal and environmental aims of our national performance framework and sustainable development goals. And that includes those around reaching net zero. And schools, and particularly in relation to gender, our STEM education and training strategy includes support for specific actions by a dedicated team of education professionals who support teachers to challenge stereotyping. The improving gender balance and equality offers have engaged with over 1,000 establishments, reaching nearly 9,500 practitioners. Of course, gender imbalance needs addressing by a wide range of participants, and every sector has a role to play if we're to reach a position where gender is not considered the main factor that determines a young person's future pathway in life. Clear Adams. The intervention. Um, my colleague Evelyn Tweed mentioned um, some of the challenges schools have in tackling some of these areas. <laughs> Would the Minister like to reflect on Tony Scullion, the young teacher who was uh, founded Dress Code, which is a specific coding club for girls, now rolled out in, uh, industry, with industry across Scotland, and is, is an exemplar of how this can be brought into our schools. And perhaps we could um, I certainly share that information with Ms Tweed to see if her schools can reach their ambition in their areas by following this example. Dennis. This really has been an illuminating uh, debate because I now discover that Claire Adams had the psychic powers as well, because I'm just coming to that point. Um, um, for those learners at school for the past three years, we've provided funding for the Young STEM Leader Award. Um, for more than 2,500 young people have already participated in the scheme right across Scotland. Uh, we know that attempting to positively influence career directions for girls should begin from an early age. Opinions about who should do what job can be formed by children from their very formative years, influenced by their parents as well as teachers, for example. These views can often stay with a young person right through to the end of their school career and beyond. So Audrey Nicholl, Pam Gozel, Pam Duncan Glancy and Stephen Kerr were right to highlight the need for work to be done in the early school year setting. So Skills Development Scotland recognise this and are taking a cross-sectoral approach in an attempt to address the issue. Um, but it's important that we attempt to tackle it by means of a holistic approach and the highlighting of female role models is critical in all of this. Um, not least of all because we know many women who have followed STEM pathways have done so because they're following the footsteps of family members. Um, as others have noted, uh, Pam Duncan Gansey in particular, uh, if you don't see people like you in a sector, you're hardly going to be drawn to it. And we need to take that on board. President officer, in amongst a raft of statistics, and there are a raft of statistics on this whole situation, is one that I found intriguing and worthy of a little further explanation. Between 2019 and 2021, the number of young women taking STEM hires rose 
from 31,795 to 32,745, at almost 1,000 more entries. And over the same period, the figure for passes amongst women increased from 23,650 to a peak of 28,135. Both those numbers subsequently de declined in 2022 for entries to a number below the, the 2019 figure and for passes to a point only 650 higher. Interestingly, the improvement covered the COVID period in which continuous assessment rather than the traditional exam-based approach was at play. Now, there's a school of thought that because women are believed traditionally to have less confidence in their abilities in this sphere, the amended alternative certification approach held an appeal for them. I say this, is, uh, and as I said earlier, I think this is something worthy of further exploration as we look to tackle this long-standing issue. And on the subject of secondary school settings, uh, can I take the chance uh, to commend the work being done at McLaren and Bannockburn High Schools in Evelyn Tweed's constituency? In his report on the Scottish technology ecosystem, Professor Mark Logan talks about the chronic imbalance in computing science at school and the fact that gender uh, role stereotyping removes almost half of our future best engineers from the workforce. Um, there's a variety of, of, of examples that I could highlight. The Tony Scullion example is one. And in response to Michelle Thompson's comments on digital, YMCA Scotland has supported a programme with Code Clan uh, to address recruitment, retention and progression of women in STEM. But for all the good intentions and all the good, great effort, there is still a very long way to go. The stats are sobering. Whilst women comprise 49% of those in employment, only 27% of STEM professionals' posts are held by women. And in the engineering professions, the figure is 11%. As I said at the outset, there's some excellent work going on out there. And I, I'm aware of the contribution of Robert Gordon's university. Uh, and as we look for uh, other best practice, and again, Aberdeen and the surrounding area is where your attention is drawn to. Because beyond the work of RGU and others, you look at the North East College and their Girls in Energy programme, which has introduced more than 650 young women into engineering, providing pathways to college, university and apprenticeships. And more than 75% of them have pursued engineering after leaving school. I met with some of them on a visit to the Angus Training Group a little while back, and I was struck with how warmly they spoke of the initiative. And I contrasted those conversations with one I heard with a girl from my own constituency who'd pursued her career path in spite of the educational influences around her, which included her being told by a teacher that engineering wasn't girls' work and that she might want instead to consider hair and beauty or childcare. Is it any wonder we struggle to get young women into this line of work? Also, as we know, apprenticeships are a key way for employers to invest in their uh, workforce, provide the skills needed both now and in the future, but while girls achieve as well as boys in apprenticeships, they participate at a much lower rate. Uh, and in acknowledgement of that, Skills Development Scotland have identified a series of practical steps that employers can take to offer a more flexible approach. And with colleges, there has been limited program, uh, progress in improving the gender imbalance at college level. But as an illustration of the hill that's yet to be climbed, uh, in 2021, only 2% 2 of starts on construction and related modern apprenticeships were female. But this is not a problem peculiar to Scotland, absolutely. Pam Duncan Clancy. I, I thank the Minister for taking that intervention. And since he's mentioned colleges, I feel it would be remiss of me not to, not to bring this up. Six, nearly 60% of students in colleges are women. Is the Minister concerned at the redundancies that we're seeing across Scotland in relation to colleges? And what does he think his government can do to protect women from those as well as others? Minister. President officer, and, and there goes the consensus. I thought we were talking about a highly important issue on STEM. The member knows full well that I have concerns about the situation as caused, and we've covered that before. President officer, um, this is not a problem peculiar to Scotland. Whilst in the Isle of Wight last week as part of an island's for the, uh, forums uh, gathering. I visited the local college there. The setup was very impressive. But wandering around the engineering area, I was struck that from a cohort of circa 30, only one woman was present. And I relate that not to deflect from the issue confronting us here in Scotland, but by way of illustration of the fact no one has yet found a means of cracking this. Design officer, as the motion for this debate rightly notes, we need to aim for a culture in which women and girls can enjoy and take advantage of equality of opportunity in STEM. 
This is an ambition that will take time and patience to fully deliver, but we need to make progress faster. So I'm I think the, the Member is just about to, the Minister is about to conclude. It's that we have the support for our ambitions both here in Parliament and beyond. As part of my ministerial portfolio, I will um, work with partners to achieve a common understanding of what actions will deliver sustainable improvement and implement these. And as part of that, I am absolutely open to ideas and suggestions from whichever direction they come. Presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m. Thank you.